All right, let's get into the records. You, we, we pulled out uh, about 10 or 15 records that Bernie mastered that were uh, important to him or that he could think of at the time when I asked him. But when we got here, he, he uh, <laughs> pulled out a record that he wasn't even thinking about, and he was told us the story. And uh, so go yeah, ahead this, and tell this, us about okay, this. Okay, well, this album, this is, this, it's an interesting album because I, I hadn't even remembered it, but a few years ago that an audio file, uh, in stereo file, they reviewed a company that had re reissued this. Now, this is an original pressing that I got online recently because I never even kept a copy. This was way back in the early 1970s. And it was an album that uh, A&M had made, Herb and Jerry, Herb Alpert, Jerry Moss, A&M. They had recorded this, but they didn't like it. And it was in the mid-60s they recorded it. But they, since I had some time when I first went to work for them in 1968, uh, I was, you know, doing their mastering, but they were, they were, everything was in-house, so I had a lot of extra time and they said, why don't you go in Studio B and, and we want to replace all the tracks on this. Uh, we'll keep his voice, which is great, but we're going to put, replace the drums, we're going to replace this, we're going to replace that, all this stuff. And so I went into the studio. I'm not really a, I'm not really a recording engineer, really. I mean, I've done some work and I did some work at Contemporary even before A&M. But uh, I, most of my work was mastering because in, at Contemporary I was keeping up the catalog, mainly. Uh, but anyway, it was, it was an interesting and fun experience. Uh, and I, but this, but this particular album, I um, recorded everything except his voice, but I, and I remixed it myself and I mastered it myself. <laughs> I took it all the way from uh, the beginning in a sense all the way to cutting the disc, because my main job there was cutting the disc. So I, but I did all the other stuff too. But I wasn't, I didn't remember it too well. But here's this thing a couple years ago on, in Stereophile, and I thought, God, they, they, I knew it was good. I, I thought it was good, but I didn't know how good. And I thought, I, I, can, I need to get a copy of this. So my wife was looking in the online and she says, oh, there's, you, you can buy mint condition ones of these. Probably didn't sell that well. <laughs> I don't know. But so she ordered one and uh, so it came and I, I brought it over here a few weeks ago and I put it on. I was shocked. I thought, God, did I really do that? I mean, it was, it's, it's amazingly good. I mean, I, I to admit it. and I was playing it for people and everybody's going, wow. This <laughs> well, you played it yesterday. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, because I mean, I'm not. It, not just because I did it. It's just that, that that's what's surprising, though, that I did do it. Yeah, uh, no, uh, you know, but uh, it's verifiably good. But, we but, like it, it, but it's, it's really, it's Waylon Jennings. Really, yeah, but it is Waylon Jennings. Yeah. His voice is great on this. This is he was a. That's a very young photo of him, because like I said, this was recorded in the mid '60s. His voice, anyway, and then the early '70s is when we actually put this thing all back together. But uh, so anyway, that's an interesting story on this particular album. Now maybe these guys that are selling the ones that didn't sell are going to sell. <laughs> maybe they're going to sell some of them. I don't know. All right. So. Oh, so now we have Carpenters. Carpenters. Well, Carpenters, yeah. Carpenters, uh, I did everything they ever did, which is, I don't know, it's about 12 albums. And from the beginning. And... Uh, it's interesting about them too. Uh, in those days, um, they actually didn't spend a lot of time in mastering, and and some of it is that they they, they really did kind of trust me, which I I realize now that it's pretty flattering that they trusted me, uh, and uh, they were. Uh, I mean, they were so successful that they got so busy with their just performances and live things and various things. That um, that I I was pretty much left to myself to just uh, set these up the way I wanted, and then I would give them. Of course, we always gave tests to the artists or the producers, uh, test lacquers, and uh, and of course it's difficult sometimes to do twelve tunes, 10, 10 or twelve tunes, and have them all consistent. Uh, we try to do that, but. Uh, Sometimes when they get it at home, they listen to it and they find other little subtle things that they want to change. Hopefully, I'm basically there, and usually that's the case. 
occasionally they want some other kind of approach, uh, and, and I'll have to redo it because, you know, I can take these things in the wrong direction for what they're expecting from their music. And it isn't even that it's wrong. It's that it's not what they envisioned. It's not, it, it's not um, you know, amplifying the feeling that they wanted. So uh, I could make it a little bit too romantic when they didn't want it quite that romantic. You know, it's like, or, or I can make things aggressive. I can make them uh, very mild and, and easy to listen to, like background music. I mean, anything like that. We can do a lot in mastering. We can change the whole feeling of a tune a lot of times. And so, uh, so we have to try to, like I was saying earlier, we have to try to figure out what's the best uh, portrayal of this music. And it's good to have a back and forth with the artist and the producer, and kind of like, when, especially even if they're in on the session, I can try a few things that I think will work, and then I can bounce it off of them, or they can have comments as well. It's just like mixing. In a way, it's a process similar to mixing. It's that everybody's trying to figure out how to get to the best place to put this music out for people to access. Were they normally happy? Do you yeah, remember? they were. They were. Yeah, it was usually they liked what, what I did. was doing. Yeah. Uh, I had a system though that was hard to understand for other people. I had gotten very used to it. My monitors were not. Uh, I, you know, it's it's one of those things where. I got so used to my monitors that I knew what things should sound like on them. And, um, but other people, they, they were a little different than what most people heard in a lot of the studios. And this is, uh, I've even talked about this in my seminars and so forth, is that you, you, you should have a monitoring system that's neutral, that's important, so you know and you can hear all these little subtle changes you might be doing. Because if the speaker is hypey, and the speaker's creating all kinds of extra air and sizzle or whatever some of these speakers do. Some of them, are, some of them even sound like the tweeters are broken to me because they're buzzy or sizzly. They give you this false sense of space. It's hard to hear into it when you're doing slight little EQ changes. It's hard to really understand how much you're changing it. Uh, so uh, the monitor is extremely important. And so, but, for, but the problem with that monitor is that I originally started out with is that my clients that would come in had trouble relating to it. So it's, it's really better to have a system that everybody can kind of relate to. And uh, so when I opened my own studio, eventually I, I put in a system that is neutral, but people can relate to it. And they can hear what I'm doing too when I'm making subtle changes. The speakers are so neutral that they're not coloring the sound at all. In fact, the monitors I use uh, if it isn't a good recording, they sound terrible. If it's a good recording, they come alive. So I know where that live thing should be. Because if my speakers say it's nice and live and open, and it's probably doing that everywhere. So uh, some speakers help that out and all that. And I don't want, uh, it's interesting to say too that when I did, uh, uh, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but when I did Asia for Steely Dan, when they came in, they wanted to use their monitors. And their monitors were a, a new model, some, a German speaker, and they were good, but they were too good. They were making all the bass real tight, they were making everything ultra detailed, and I thought, no. I, I told them, I said, no, I can't, I can't relate to these speakers. You know, I need to hear them on my speakers. And which make me work a little harder. But when I'm done with it, usually it's going to speak well on most systems. That's the main thing. Is it's going to generally has to sound anywhere you play it, reasonably good. You know, some some monitor systems won't play it as good as other ones. But you don't want to be so far off that there's a whole group of or types of speakers that aren't going to that aren't going to sound good. So. Uh, you don't want to have, like, like I've been around speakers where you put, a, put, put, put things up there and everything sounds great. You don't even do anything to it then. But then it doesn't sound good on, like, say, a car speaker or on something. You know, you've got to, 
And, and I found that it's very interesting that when you do uh, extra EQ and various things to help things uh, speak and have presence and so forth, it's all right. You know, it, even though they sounded really fine on these other speakers, they even sound better now on the good spe on the ones speakers that are are harder to relate to. It just sounds that much better. So uh, it's it's pretty mysterious in some ways, and it's something that takes a lot of experience to, of getting used to. Even it, mixers are that way too, getting used to the microphones, which microphone to use. So. So, you know, it, it all comes down to that kind of a thing, too. It's, it's uh, knowing what to do and, and uh, what's going to give you the sound that you're envisioning, you know, because you have to have some kind of ideal that you're going for. And uh, so, uh, it, 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 and it has a lot to do with the different types of music. So it's good to know a lot of different types of music because you need to learn and kind of hear some of the best examples of any kind of music. Well, these two were, I mean, great. I mean, the, the sonic qualities and the production of both of these bands, and they're, they're way mm -hmm. different, but they they weren't different in the in the in the care and the. I mean, Richard Carpenter. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So I mean, did you get to uh, to know Karen and Richard? Oh yeah. Well? Oh sure. Yeah, they came in and we would work a little bit, but but they 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 didn't spend a lot of time in the in mm -hmm. the mastering room. But you did get to, to meet them. Oh, sure, you? yeah. They were around the street. See, they recorded at A&M, right yeah. in the same building. They, yeah. they, so we, we'd see each other. They'd stop by. And I'd but I mean, at that when you were doing this between 69 and 73, they were the hottest thing in the world. Oh, yeah, they were big. And, yeah, uh, they were big. Yeah, it's, so these things sound good, man. This, the carpenters. Yeah, no, they, and they, yeah. And, and that, the, the boards and things at A&M were really quite good. Yeah. Uh, they, they were uh, very, uh, the, they, again, it was like they were highly simplified in a way. Uh, they they didn't have good. major. They didn't have like huge signal paths with all kinds of things in the signal path. They, they were. It's like old school. You know, a lot of the older recordings were done practically direct to two track or direct to mono. Yeah. Well, uh, there was, uh, in that's fact, the best at, uh, stuff. at yeah, one of the main studios on Sunset Sunset Sound is what it's called. <laughs> They've been there forever. And I remember when I first saw that studio in the late 60s, uh, the board looked like something out of a radio station. It was just levels. And if you wanted equalization on one of the, one of the microphone channels, you had to plug it in. Wow. It wasn't there all the time. You had to put it in the circuit. <laughs> so that's how primitive it was in a way. But you know, and it's always been this difficulty between flexibility and quality. You know, as time went on, multi-track, 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 and then more channels, more channels, and more flexibility, more ability to manipulate a lot of the elements of the mix. But there's a price to pay, and that's the quality loss. So when everything got more and more complex, they could do more things in a way, but, they're, but all of that stuff, when you're putting electronics in any circuit, you're gonna lose some quality. So uh, even these boards that we have, the way we've done it is we have only the frequency that we're using in the circuit, similar to what I'm talking about. So we, we, we designed all this system, our systems here, but we're only dealing with two channels here. But uh, we, we designed these and we built all of this equipment ourselves. Uh, we designed these so that uh, we can bypass everything, so that uh, nothing's in the signal path. So if the tape is really good, if it's a great recording, great mix, we can transfer that right over to the lacquer with basically almost no loss. We can compare it to the tape and it's almost impossible to tell the difference. So another band, Steely Dan, you've done a lot of work with. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's even right. doing their new records. Uh, the Oh yeah, the live ones. The live yeah, ones they've right. got new. I don't even know if they're out on the market yet. I, I, I think they. I think they're just hitting. Yeah, yeah, they did a nice job on it. I mean, it's it sounds like a, a studio recording. <laughs> right. So I mean, you well, of course they they care. <laughs> oh yeah, they're, they're really. They're, yeah. The Carpenters, Steely Dan, Pink Floyd, oh, they're yeah. the kind that everything mattered, and I know you've worked with them a lot, and this is this is one of the top. 25 albums for audiophiles, classic, oh, yeah. 
uh, sound quality. I mean, to, to mass, and this was a huge hit. So to master this one, uh, yeah, was I, that so. was uh, that was a real joy. I mean, it was really noticeably uh, better than most anything. I mean, it, it stood out. I remember when I first put it on, uh, it was like wow. I mean, it just comes right at you, and it's nicely done. Good presence, but good space, good depth. Uh, Bruce Wadeen can do that too with Michael Jackson, people like that. He, he's one of those mixers, and these guys are too. Uh, Elliot Shiner, I think, was involved in this. Yeah, Elliot Shiner, uh, Roger they, Nichols. Yeah. Oh, shoot, Bill Shanae and yeah, Al see, Schmidt. Yeah, see, those are some of the best. Pete, Al Schmidt is great Roger too. Roger Nichols, Elliot Shiner, Bill Shanae, Al Schmidt. Yeah, these are some of the best mixers in the world. Uh, and what, what they're able to do, and here's an interesting aspect that uh, I've observed over the years. Uh, Mick Uzowski is also one of them, but uh, is the really the best mixers know how to create an environment for you to go into, and like it transports you from where you're sitting and listening to this special area. It's a space, it's an environment where this music exists and it's almost like a private place where it draws you in. So in other words, Bruce could get, or these guys can get this nice presence on everything, but you could go in there and walk around. I don't know how they do it. I'm not a mixer but they have this spatial thing that doesn't interfere with presence. Now that's it's very hard to do. I've done some mixing myself and it's not easy to do that. Uh, you have to have a lot of uh, experience on how to manipulate things and reverbs and stuff like that and with delays and so forth. But, uh, but the best mixers create an environment. If you want to have more spatial things and you want to have more depth and so forth, there's a lot of signal there that gets lost in a lot of these mixes. And, uh, and it's recoverable if you have the right equalizers. And we have equalizers that go out to 30,000 cycles. And, uh, and there's information up there that actually gives you the spatial and the soundstage size and also gives you a lot of depth. So if you can accentuate that, it actually opens the whole thing up. Or you can do, go at the opposite way. If you, if you rearrange the bottom, you, you would swear I've added all kinds of air and space and top. So there's all kinds of tricks in this. I guess it is a dark thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's all kinds of little tricks and stuff if you have the tools. And one of the uh, responsibilities, and I say this in my seminars you know, to these engineers, I say, look, part of your responsibility is also to have the right tools around you to give you what you would feel it needs. You know, you have to, if you have these places you want to go, you have to be able to manipulate the sound and make it go there. So you have to like test out equipment and test out various things to see what's going to serve you the best. And so that's, that's why we built all this stuff ourselves. You know, I noticed uh, Bernie Grunman at A&M Studios. Right. Uh -huh. So you were still... Oh uh, yeah, I was at A&M. Yeah. When did you leave A&M? A&M I left in... Uh, because this is a 1977. 19, not till not till 84. <laughs> oh, shoot. That's when I opened my studio. 1984. On Sunset. Wow. So, yeah. I was there for 15 years. No kidding. So, yeah, there you go, man. Steeler Dan Asia, what? Yeah, well, I mean, that system, I mean, the system I put in on, on uh, when I opened up my own studio had a lot of similarities to a yeah. system. I mean, because I, I, those were the tools that I was working with, and I knew they were good. That's why I didn't open it right away. We, we built all the equipment ahead of time. <laughs> so, all right, well, you, you cut the uh, UHQ. Now, that's, now, there's a different, now, this is a recut and a remastering. Right, but, yeah. but it was a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> very well, good. sometimes I can do a lot. You know, yeah. it depends. You know, sometimes they were done really well. Other times, I just kind of put in what I think is going to make it better. Well, you know, um, we we press all the quality record pressings press all the Hendrix and uh, we're very proud of that and uh, and we have a good relationship with the uh, the Hendrix family and the experienced mm -hmm. Hendrix and John McDermott and they trust us and uh, and now I know they trust you and so when we license this for UHQR um, we had you master it and I didn't. Um, 
I don't think I even sent you the original, which I usually like to do to help, uh, mm -hmm. and usually that can help, but we made the test pressing, and it just knocked my socks off, and I'm like going, wow. You know, I didn't send him the original. I didn't um, suggest anything, you know, like. I don't think I, I compared to anything. Yeah. I and, just did it. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> Maybe so. No, no, I'm glad because uh, it, it, it came all back awesome. And I knew I didn't even, sometimes when you listen, it sounds so good that I don't have to go, well, let me get the original compare. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know, and I knew that, but I'm like. Later on, I'm like, well, let's just for, uh, you know, uh, shits and grins. Uh, and it was exactly what I thought. I mean, it just, just did a whole, such a good job. And then, so we did the stereo mm. and you did the mono. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, on these, um, we did 5,000 that sold out like that. And we did 1,500 monos and they sold out. But... Uh, but yeah, this is uh, well. Someone like Jimi Hendrix, you know, you're going to have uh, a lot of interest in that because he's one of the main iconic figures of that whole period, uh, the the hippie period and so forth, and all guitar. of that. The, 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 yeah, the Woodstock stuff and all of that. The whole kind era. of psychedelic. Oh yeah, that big. Guitar. It was a big period. Yeah. And so, and he was one of the main people that was. And even even this cover reflects that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh. But uh, but anyway, he yeah, he definitely had this kind of special thing about him, you know. This uh, and it's funny how that is. The same way with the Doors, you know. Uh, if you don't have the leader, a lot of times they they, they tried to keep going, you know, the Doors. Yeah. And without him. <laughs> Forget it. You know, it's just he, he, the way his voice is and the way he sounds and with what he puts you're not into gonna it, replace, you, you can't replace yeah, it. Yeah, you're not going to replace Jimmy Morrison and no. nobody's going to replace Jimi Hendrix. But no. look at the variety of stuff you master. Oh, I mean, yeah. Every day yeah. is just yeah. such a different, uh, you're not going to get bored in here, at least musically. Yeah. But uh, we, we, uh, you might be doing something with this one soon for us. Ah. Just a little surprise, maybe. Great. But, uh, yeah. Well, I, I, won't, I've won't known Bruce. You know, he actually is one of my oldest clients. Bruce Broughton? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I actually worked with him when I was a contemporary. Real? Oh, yeah. He would bring, I was, you know, I was doing custom work. Yeah. So he would bring things. That, he was a mixer. He actually was there before I, I, I got, into, got into Hollywood in 1966. He actually was mixing. Uh, two or three years before that, like I think he did things like Buffalo Springfield or something, or you know, I, I forget what they are, but but he he was one of the real hot shot new young kids on the block. But he's been, I mean, he his if you look him up, and I mean, I know you know this, but uh, I didn't know, and a lot of people don't know. I mean, he did a lot of soundtracks. He was teaching uh, absolutely recording yes. at uh, UCLA, I think, or one of the yeah. colleges here. Uh, you know, he did Stones, Eddie Money, All the Doors. Yeah, Eddie Money, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just... He did a uh, lot of stuff. A lot, yeah, a yeah. lot. Of, like, he might be one of the most uh, yeah, yeah, he's, busy engineers. Yeah. And, uh, of course, he'll be involved. Well, that, that, that's like, that just keeps going, The Doors. That's another yeah. group that... Excuse me. Yeah, anything, anything that they did, they're going to put out. Because they, they didn't put out a whole lot because he died, but uh, they're so they're digging up all kinds of stuff. <laughs> well, this is a classic, and uh, I know you've worked with with Bruce. Oh yeah, Bruce is uh, all a, a right. good old friend. We're gonna throw in some classical here. Uh, the RCA Living Stereo, the Scheherazade, oh, yeah, yeah. and the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. Yeah, well, this the Bartok Concerto for Orchestra it, it was a surprise to me. I mean, I knew it was good, and I had copies of it at home, but I didn't realize how good the master tape was. Uh, and it was a reissue and w w to remaster for uh, classic records uh, as an audiophile version. 
and, uh, and, and it's, it really stood out compared to most RCA living stereo recordings. And, and a lot of them were very good, but this one in particular stood out for a few reasons. The sound is excellent. I mean, it has some of the problems that they had back in those days where the dynamics would, would interfere with the quality of the sound because it was overloading things possibly. I'm not sure because the real loud crescendos we had to be very careful of. But the basic sound of it was pretty spectacular. And on top of that, it is the definitive version of that piece of music, which is one of the most important pieces of music of the 20th century. It's right up there with Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. I like it better, but that's my own personal feeling about it. But it's always been a controversy about what is the most important major piece of music of the 20th century. This one, I think, is. And people that don't know this have a real treat if, if they understand classical music. This really takes you on a journey. And it takes you on a lot of journeys, but it ties them all together. It's a five movements. It's it's pretty extensive piece of music, but it's incredible what this composer did. But it's also this recording is the most cohesive one that I've ever heard by Fritz Reiner in the Chicago Symphony. So Go out and buy this. No, well, I was gonna say. <laughs> I'm a you know, you know what my brain, you know brain said? <laughs> Gary, put that on the press. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you better get some ready, because after all that, man, we get, we better get. No, this I, thing. I, no, that's that. That's a very important piece of music. So you had the three track with this. Well, no, no, I'm, maybe I'm not this sure one. on that one. That one well, might have only been a two track. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a lot of them were three track. Yeah, I, yeah. Actually, I actually mixed it, mixed the three track. You know what? Uh, I think you're right. This was two. I think that was two. But this was three. That yeah. But you know, talk about because um, a lot of people are good. now. Talk about uh, these are the analog productions that we put out after. But talk about. Uh, when Hobson, how you met Hobson, or you know, just maybe tell a uh, how many. I mean, y'all did like over a hundred of these things. I mean, y'all did. Just... We did five hundred albums. Wow. Over a five or six year period. We wow. Did, we did. It was four or five hundred albums, and most of them actually, most of them were actually classical. Yep. But we did do, uh, we did the uh, some pop pop albums, of course. Jazz, uh, jazz. and some jazz. Yeah, we did some jazz, but we did an awful lot of classical. And um, uh, yeah, they came in one day. I mean, he and uh, Ying Tan, uh, uh, they were kind of partners at the time, yeah. but Mike Hobson. And, uh, and and they just sat down with me and they said, gee, you know, we're, 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 we're trying to revive the vinyl audiophile area of, uh, of, of business reissue. and we want to reissue we're, we're going to start licensing things and we, we want to know if you're interested in um, doing our mastering and uh, of course that's music to my ears because I really prefer some of these old classic recordings anyway because they were practically direct to two track so some of them are pretty spectacular so I said absolutely you know I'm here <laughs> 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 when you want to start? Yeah, when you, you know. So, so we just started in, and I I was doing a lot of albums though. I mean, we I, I would even work sometimes on Sunday morning just trying to get them set up and cut. And uh, and Hobson, I, I have to hand it to him. I mean, he was a true audiophile. I mean, he didn't care how much time it took me. Some of these things that had maybe uh, some of the jazz things that had female vocalists or something like that, where we get a little sibilance breakup on the playback, we went to the trouble of actually. We have high frequency limiters that that tame that so that it'll track better, but it's another piece of equipment in the circuit. We actually went around and we marked every S on the whole album, and it'd be dozens and dozens of S's, and we would put the de -esser in and out just for the S. We put a mark on the tape where the S was, and we would just de nice. that one S on the fly as it was cutting. And so sometimes we'd make a mistake, of course, and we'd have to start over, but 
that was what he wanted us to, I mean, we wanted to do anything possible to keep the quality. And so that, that I have to hand it to him. He, he really was a true audiophile that way. I mean, he, he didn't care about, I mean, he wanted it you know, some people that are concerned about the cost of these things. And, uh, but, but actually when it came to the mastering, he just, he, he just wanted me to do everything I could to make it the best quality. And they were, and they, they, they're going for big bucks. People love them, still want them. And, uh, and uh, that's what, what they want. They want to believe that the label they're buying is not going to stop, you know, let a couple dollars get in between them right, and making right. a good record, you know? Well, th th which means that it has like a kind of this uh, recognizable quality just by being one of these releases. Mm -hmm. Right. You, know, you know what I mean? It's like a brand. It's almost like a it's brand. Exactly it's like they know if brand. you put this out as an audiophile version, uh, they probably would buy it even if they didn't know the music because well, they know it's good. Well, a lot of them, they did, did yeah, that, you yeah. know, because then that's why it's so important, you know, that we feel like that on analog productions and on classic mm -hmm. yeah. records because I ended up buying classic records in the name but and the inventory but uh, and equipment. But... If they buy two records from a label and they're blown away, and that label comes out with a third record, they're going and they, but even if they, they haven't heard the artist. Oh, no, oh, yeah. Right. Contemporary was that way. Right. You'd see a contemporary. I remember as a kid, as a teenager, when I bought that first contemporary album, I said, wow, this is really great sound. And as an audiophile, I would see an album in the store, and I would just buy it. I, I knew it would be good. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a great segue. So talking about contemporary, um, you know, you've worked there. Um, I worked there for a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first came to Hollywood, that was my first job in Hollywood. I had worked in a small studio. Well, it wasn't really small, that small, but the, the major studio in Phoenix, Arizona of all places. But hey, uh, they had a pretty good studio there. And they had actually my idol, Roy Dunan working there. That's why I worked there for a while because I had to be with this guy and learn more about it. But then I, uh, through him and through various connections, I was able to actually go to work at Contemporary as their engineer. And it, 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 there's a lot of experience that I gained there because the, uh, Lester Koenig that owned uh, Contemporary CDs. Records, was a, he's the, one of the biggest perfectionists I ever worked for. And these recordings, we had to do practically mix them sometimes because they were directed two tracks, and there and there were certain things that were being adjusted as it was being recorded. And uh, but but if they were good performances in jazz, if they're good performances, you want to somehow keep that no matter what, e even if you have to manipulate it while you're uh, cutting the disc. And that's what we did. The two of us would work together sometimes all day, just to get a set of lacquers. And and uh, he was very concerned about it being the best it can be on the fly with these, we choreograph it even about who would do what and who would change EQ, who would change level, who would. So a lot of these records were done that way just to optimize them for the listener. And uh, so I learned a lot though about equalization and how to manipulate sound and so forth. So. Uh, this is one of this. Of course, this is, and some of them were better than other ones. Of course, I mean this always happens. Musically. But these, these are these. Are, the most famous ones are these two: the Way Out West and Our Pepper Meets the Rhythm Section, and they're they're definitely very impressive sounding. They sound very real. That's the thing about them. They're just uh, very little electronics was used in these recordings. So, uh, so when you bought your first, when you first went to the first stereo store, oh yeah, you bought a contemporary record. We, you know, and we were talking about how you bought a record, and you go, "Wow, this label's good. I'll buy more." Yeah, yeah. So didn't that that kind of got you started? Well, that it it did. Well, I mean, I I I, I was already interested in sound. Mm -hmm. No, and yeah. I, I there were some good sounding recordings. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not the only ones. Uh, because that was a big factor then, you know, when stereo was coming in and all of this stuff. Uh, 
just the sound, you know, hi-fi came in in the mid-50s. And uh, so everybody was, and this was the main source of uh, music entertainment, were records. And so any advances, like they call living stereo or whatever, all of these advances, people, the general public was more interested, I mm -hmm. think, than, than they are now, because they've got all these other things now right. that they're, that's getting their attention. But back then, this was one of the primary things. So when they came out with what they would call a new recording process, people were interested. Mm -hmm. They weren't always that great, but they were this as a selling well, point. But these albums, uh, uh, I, I came to them because of the, the, the hi-fi shop that I bought some of my equipment. He started getting these recordings. But to be able to work for the company that you you know you bought their record. Well, that yeah, that was a dream come true. Right, you yeah. bought their record. You read Roy Dunan's yeah. name. You get to work for him, and that's your start. And yeah. then, you know, you you told us about Roy was like the main guy, Capital before. For the well, Roy, yeah, Roy had a long uh, history of electronics for one thing, and uh, he was uh, even. Did some work while he was in the military, but he was head of he was the head of Capital Recording in the 40s and early 50s until Lester Koenig at Contemporary actually kind of poached him, yeah. got, got you know, and actually put him in, in into the Contemporary system and, and to build that studio, build the studio for Contemporary, and I I, I almost think that unknowingly Roy was trying to do it real simply and inexpensively. And by doing it though, the sound was incredible. Yeah. You know? and, and, and I mean, he knew it was good sound, but I, I, don't, I don't know if he knew how great it was. Because I would, I would say well, that to him, how right great sounds. his recordings were, and he would say, really? <laughs> right, because you know, uh, he was probably try. he probably was on a budget. Yeah. He wasn't on the, yeah. Thank God that uh, you know he wasn't on the capital budget. He might have bought all the new fandangled stuff that well, would it could be because he he did it he did it, the way he set up that whole system was a way that it was tailored for direct to two track. Now, I think capital they had more flexibility and things mm -hmm. they could do as overdubbing and whatever. They didn't really even have overdubbing or anything, really, at Contemporary. It was straight through, and the signal path was almost nothing, no, no electronics in there. In fact, he used high-level microphones. The C12. Yeah, C12s, KM56s, U47s. He used all the best microphones, and, uh, but those are high-output microphones, so he needed very little uh, preamplification. So there was a lot of, uh, he didn't have to do a lot of extra gain to make up even through the mixing board. So the mixing board was highly simplified. So all of this stuff adds up to ending up with a very pure, clean, natural sounding signal. And later on, they actually put in a small board that had a lot of flexibility, the sound was gone. Wow. So you reminded us. Oh, that. Yeah. Oh, I, oh you found those down there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I brought them in. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Perfect. All of this is just so perfect because I'd forgotten about this, but we're both uh, talking about Lester Koenig, who owned Contemporary, who gave you one of your first major jobs, got you started, had a son named John Koenig, which, uh, who, how, oh, I wonder how old John was. When, do you remember him being a... Well, he was, yeah, he was pretty, he seemed, I, I don't know how much younger, he was at least old. 10 years yeah. younger than me. So yeah. maybe he was like 10 years old or something, uh, farting around the studio, but... So when I licensed these, the first uh, records I licensed from uh, Fantasy, Fantasy owned Contemporary, along with Prestige, Riverside, and Pablo. First thing I did in 1992 was Way Out West. And uh, you know, then I'm, uh, John Koenig found out about it, contacted me, hey, I'm Lester Koenig's son, I'd like to get to know you. Told me all the history, we got to be friends, we made a blues record in 1994. Mm -hmm. And when I went to do these on Gold CD, John's like, listen, I know you love Doug. I know you use Doug. Let me tell you about Bernie Grunman. He used to work there. This is why you need to let Bernie have, have a shot at this because this uh, is very, means a lot to Bernie. He loves jazz. He loves, you know, uh, these recordings. Let him do it. I'm like, then I, I had an idea. I, I don't know if it was a good idea. It was, I think, uh, 
Well, it for, was audio, a, for audio files, it is. I mean, some guys really like to compare things. Right, yeah. right. So I, I thought it was a good idea at the time, and I did it, and so I, let's not regret it. But again, hey, if nothing else, it's a good story right now, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, John. I wanted to make John happy, and it, it sounded like, you know, there was reasons why Bernie should do it. So I said, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have Doug do it, and I'm going to have Bernie do it. And we're going to release them at the same time. One is Doug and one is Bernie. Had pictures of them inside. And uh, we're going to send them out to the reviewers and we're going to, people can pick whatever they want they want. Hopefully they'll buy yeah. them both, compare, and it'll be fun. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no. And, and, they, and they have to sound different because they're different systems. Yeah. They're, they're completely different systems. Uh, so uh, e even the these are uh, digital also the digital yeah, processing yeah. is similar probably but but still I don't know what kind of A to D uh, converter he had or whatever and that all influences it so no matter what you do they're going to sound different and you're going to find probably uh, people that like either one you know I mean right. you're going to find that uh, it, it depends on the person. Uh, uh, what what's what's important to them or I mean it's basically the same music and all hey, that. Look, I mean, but <laughs> it's two of the best mastering engineers in the world they both gonna be great yeah and uh, and uh, yeah, we I think the balance is very similar yeah the balance is very similar it's just that the the the, 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 the like the personality of the sound is a little different and I think one of the things that was different uh, I don't think he was using dither at the time and processing at a higher sampling, at ha higher dither rate, because they have to dither this down to, it has to be down to 16 bit uh, for CDs. And uh, if you don't dither it, it, it's truncated. And so it, it, it causes a little bit different sound. Some people liked it and they, and they let it clip, uh, the dither, just mm -hmm. the dithering. So, um, but, uh, so that I think that's probably one of the differences too, is because I was dithering the one that I did. Yeah, actually, I just discovered that I liked the dithering and what it did to it. So um, we've been talking about Diana Warwick. Oh yeah, you, oh you got one of those. Di Di yeah, <laughs> yeah, and this is a great sounding record. So you were telling me more about um, about her and 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 Bert working. Backrack. Oh, Bert Backrack. Yeah, yeah. yeah Bert she Backrack. did all of those. On, do you know the way to San Jose and all that stuff? She did all the Burt Backrack tunes, which was a great songwriting team anyway. Burt Backrack and Hal David, and some beautifully recorded uh, uh, albums. It was all on a uh, company called Scepter. Yep. And uh, and I did a lot of albums about, but with her, uh, but they the mixing was excellent uh, on the stuff, and the sound quality was good. It was one of the better studios in New York. So here's another Burt Bacharach, and you oh, cut yeah, this for sure. Hobson oh, yeah. for oh, Classic is that for, Records. Is that for classic well, records? this is a different cover. Somebody uh, just reissued it um, on another uh, another label, and they put some outtakes on this. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, they added a whole other side. Uh, anyway, so you had cut this for Classic, so you were talking about Burt Bacharach, so you, there's two... All right, so now this was now that that was the that was really a, a landmark album because from what I understand, see a lot of times I don't even know what happens to these or how well they do at first, but from what I understand, this was one of the very first mega selling records. I mean, uh, this thing so still, it, still, yeah, it's uh, it was one of the first, and because this was way back too, this was. And there's an interesting story about this. Uh, uh, it, when, when, this when, this tape, when this tape came in, um, they wanted me to, you know, master it. But they, um, they wanted me to, they wanted me to master it and make some reference discs and they wanted to listen to it because they really hadn't done a lot of production on it. And they wanted to, uh, 
listen to it and decide what kind of other things they would add to it, you know, like maybe sax solo or whatever, who knows what. But they were thinking about more production because it was very simple. This is a very simple setup and recording with the number of instruments and so forth. And Lou Adler was the producer. And uh, so he said, send me up a reference disc, see what you can do, you know, but run me a reference disc because we want to decide what to do with it. So I put this, uh, the tape up, and right away from the first tune, it was like, it's, you don't get this all the time, but it, it's just one of those things where there was this kind of connection. Right away, you, you felt it. I mean, it was like, wow, this is really, she's really getting to me. She's really, this, this, this is very effective, this album, at least to me. Uh, and I was, I was knocked out by how good it was and how, how good the songs were and all of that stuff. And so I, I cut the disc, I went through it and I did maybe some minor EQ and various things, not a whole lot. And I cut a reference disc, sent it up to him. The next morning, he calls me up and he says, we're gonna leave it just like it is. Nice. We're not gonna do anything more. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, really, because it was there mm -hmm. in a very simplified form, as, as you know from this album. It's nothing bombastic, nothing. It's just the feeling is so good. She's so on, and it's her songs anyway. Uh, so uh, it's you know, and she never, she never was able to even come close to that album. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a classic. I mean, how, who knows how many millions that sold? Well, it sold a lot, and it's still selling. This happens to be the CBS Master Sound. This isn't. Oh, okay. The, I mean, I just grabbed the tapestry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody else mastered this particular one, but Bernie mastered the original. And uh, so in case like the audio files that are really trying to uh, find the exact one you mastered, this, <laughs> this one was just, um, you know, the first copy I could see. But, oh, uh, sure, but it's the, it's the, it's the same record. cover. Yeah, yeah. It's the same cover. So yeah, what yeah. a classic record. Yeah. Uh, I think they, it, it was something different for them to not tried to make it a real poppy record that, that to just to leave it natural it, it, it's just that she was so good and mm -hmm. the feeling that she was putting into her music and, i'm like i'm always into the more unplugged the demo yeah, yeah. you know before well but the, you got to be a good artist <laughs> oh yeah right 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 well she was and she is all right so uh we're going to hit hit the biggie right here now this is also, not the original cover, and somebody else probably cut this one, but uh, Michael Jackson Thriller. Biggest selling uh, now. Yeah, they're about 110 million now, is what I understand. Uh, but now, of course, it's not, they're not selling as many units, you know, what you'd call units. It's just uh, downloads and streaming and all of that kind of stuff. So it's kind of hard to tell what it would be in unit sales. Mm -hmm. But in those days, when that came out, uh, it, everybody would buy a record, yep. and uh, and it, it, it of course it kept going. I I probably cut more masters on that album than anything I've ever worked on. Over the period of two years, I cut 120 masters wow. on that. The plant was selling so many and pressing so many, and there were three plants pressing it. They kept calling for more, for more, for more. And the interesting thing about it was right in a transitional period for me, I started mastering this at, my, at the old room that I had at A&M. Then we had built new mastering rooms downstairs in this building next to us. And I kept mastering it there. And then when I opened my own studio, I was still mastering it in my studio, trying to follow Thriller with subsequent albums you know that's a lot of pressure to try to get keep the sales up and um, so Quincy only did the first three albums you know off the wall which is the first album mm -hmm. and then this was thriller was second and then uh, what was the was it bad bad bad, bad I bad, think was yeah. bad those three were done by Quincy and they were the best feeling ones actually because they were done by a bebop guy there you go. <laughs> Quincy there you go. And what happened is, and I could, I, I know the progression here, is this, this, the feeling and the rhythmic feeling of these first three albums, I feel, are the best. Now, when it got to the fourth, fifth, and, 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 and on to the subsequent albums, 
they were trying to get the feeling out of power, out of real strong snare drums and stuff like that, which is very mechanical in a lot of ways. It doesn't have the finesse and the phrasing that these have, the first three albums have. So they were trying to get energy and power, and there's a certain energy there, but the feel isn't as good. Hmm. It's almost mechanical. But it's, it's powerful. It's got that. So some people respond to that. But this one has the subtlety and the finesse that really swings, what we call swings in jazz. Uh, but as we went on, we, we got down to uh, an album called History. And that probably was his most expensive album that he ever made. And I was involved in that in a lot of ways in, in, that actually required a lot of me moving to New York for a few weeks and then coming back. And, uh, you know, they wanted me to be involved in a lot of, on a, on a lot of, in a lot of ways that uh, I don't usually get involved. I don't usually move around. I usually like to be in my studio. But it ended up being, I think this album, the, the history album, like this album probably wasn't that crazy. No, I understand. Maybe but it's the history. But the history was expensive yeah, yeah. to make because they now they, they were trying to... Well, they had the money from this album Yeah, well, they spend. were trying to make sure that it was going to be a big record. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, I think that's no, what happened. No, maybe I was hearing the story about history. But I'm sure this thing yeah, kept that was you history. busy. This kept you busy. Oh, they yeah. They probably did so well with it because it is like the album of all albums. Well, yeah. Well, one, one thing about this album is uh, they did send it over. Yeah. And they wanted reference discs and so forth. And they had spent a lot of time on it already on Thriller. And uh, so I went through it and I made the reference discs and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, they stopped. And I didn't see them for, oh, it had to be a month or two. And of course, the record company is always anxious to get the latest whatever because even Off the Wall was doing well. But they didn't like it. <clears throat> they, they wanted to redo things. They wanted to redo some of the mixes. They wanted So it was at least a month, month and a half before it came back to me. And, you know, it, that's the whole thing about mastering, too. It's like trial and error sometimes, you know, and it, for them, too. They hear then there's a finished product and they say, oh, you know, gosh, we got to make this tune better to match up with these other ones or what you know who knows you know an album is is kind of difficult because it's got a lot of tunes and they want to have a consistency and of course this album every one of them is good but uh but at first you know there's a lot of it, it took them a few years to make this album so here's another this was uh lionel richie yeah, yeah lionel richie yeah and uh this was a big seller and still is and uh, I was trying to find it I was looking for the album all night long you know and, <laughs> and uh, it's can't slow down with all night long on oh it. is that the one yeah. is that the name of it See, yeah a yeah. lot of times I didn't know the name of these no, albums. No, I know but I thought the I, same thing I, I, yeah I would do the album and I would not a lot of times would never get a copy of it you yeah. know because I'm doing so many albums that I, I just I've heard the album a number of times because I mastered it and I know that I know it's good. I know what it is, and I hear it on the radio and various things like that. But I have never. I, a lot of times, I don't even see the album. Do you remember? Did uh, so? This is '83. This is shoot. That's right. One year after. That's thrilling. right. Yeah. yeah. So did you? Uh, did he attend or do? Yeah. He he, did? he would come in. Yeah. Yeah, he would come in, but you know, uh, they were pretty. It was back and forth a little bit, but uh, these things were done extremely well and. They liked what I was doing, so. Uh, but but see, this one I think was done at A and M maybe, and yeah, and, and so and and yeah, I, it's before the new room at A and M, uh, and and so it had the speakers that a lot of people couldn't relate to. <laughs> <laughs> so they just trusted you. Yeah, they they trusted me a lot of the times. Yeah, well, this because was... I would have to calm them down because they they'd come in and they'd be sitting there, and and they say, "Is that my mix?" And I would say, "Don't worry about it." You know, I know these speakers. <laughs> well, that's a lot of trust they had in you. Well, but, because I was, the things were coming out of there that were really good. Yeah. You know, and I had a good system. Uh, that, that, that helped me a lot, too, just having a good, you, you know, that's the whole thing. You've got to have the right system that you're working with. It's not just you. It, you know, this is all man and machine. You know, that's what a lot of it is. Both things have to be really the best to make it 
the best product in the end. So, uh, uh, and we had a good system there. We had, we had a, and a lot of this is patterned after that. So, I remember this, baby. Oh yeah, that was, uh, that uh, was a big record. Breakfast in America, uh, Take the Long Way Home, Breakfast in America, The Logical Song, uh, it's very interesting lyrics on the logical song. Uh, I was g going to school at the time, oh. a, a bad boy school, and if you listen to the lyrics, it was, and it was not, right when it came out, it was exactly, um, he, uh, they obviously was went to- speaking to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they actually, they obviously went to that same kind of school as well. Okay. But, uh, so you remember this one, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, they were, yeah. We had a good time making, uh, going through this one. They were there. Really? When we, yeah, when we put it together and so forth. Yeah, they were so... Again, it's in one of those things where they really couldn't top that after that album. Yeah. It was difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they were riding high, and it, hey, if you can just do it once, that's pretty damn good. Right. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Especially at that level. and that, that uh, This is a, a promo. So this is a very uh, first. That's a rare This rare. is 1979. Yeah, that was done in the old room at a and Did yeah, Did a and done... have like a trumpet looking logo? In the... Yeah, I think they did, yeah. Yeah, look yeah, at this. Did. Look at this thing. Can you see that right there? I'll be careful with my original now. No, I'm just kidding. Oh yeah, there is yeah, a trumpet. Yeah, there's a trumpet. Yeah. You yeah, almost have had. Uh, yeah, somebody had a stamp. Yeah. How about that? Well, you mentioned Prince. Oh yeah. Well, that was that's another big album. Well, Prince was. There were so many big albums. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what a what an artist, you know, uh, Prince. But it's very interesting about Prince because I I worked with him for a long time. He's the most prolific guy that I've ever worked with. I w he would come in, he didn't like LA anyway, he didn't like the business part of the record industry. And he, and he would come in for one day maybe and listen through t his, to his album and go right back to Minneapolis. And then I would send him refs and so forth and we would communicate over the phone. He just, uh, and that's why they had that falling out and all that stuff where the, the formerly known as Prince mm -hmm. stuff and all that stuff that he was doing because he just, maybe they were trying to control him about what they thought he should do, but he's a real serious artist. And he, he wanted to do what he wanted to do, you know, and, and, and rightfully so. Very talented guy, he could do everything. And, uh, and his stuff felt great. I mean, it was real obvious from the start that uh, he could get a rhythm thing going that was excellent. And, um, but Prince was an interesting character because, you know, the first, all these albums that I was doing, the first three maybe, he would come in the studio and he would sit in the corner and, and kind of like even squeeze himself into the corner and he would just kind of sit there. And I would be listening to his album. And he might say, well, maybe, maybe we could put a little more bass on this tune or something like that, you know, and I say, oh, okay, let's try it, you know, let's just try a little more bottom and see if we get a little more punch out of it or whatever, you know, he's looking for. But that's about all he would say. He never would say much. He was very timid, very, and then at a certain point, my wife and I were watching TV and there was a live performance of him and my God, I couldn't believe it was, that's Prince. <laughs> he was all over the place, running all over the stage, <laughs> doing flips or whatever. I mean, I thought, wow, I had no idea. Right. That he could do that, yeah. Because he was so quiet and, and withdrawn. Well, maybe when he hit that stage. Oh when yeah. He well, then they say that on. sometimes about performers, that they they're really on when they're on stage. Other than that, and my even my wife, she used to teach acting for the Strasbourg Institute and so forth. She used to and, and be in acting classes herself, and she says, "Well, if you want to go to a boring party, go to a party of actors." Because yeah. they don't know who they are. When <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it, man. No, he uh, I, that doesn't surprise me, and it doesn't surprise me about Mike, Michael Jackson. But what I am noticing 
is like the, the Lionel Richie album, the Thriller, and this album, I mean, you know, we're talking, this is 84, so this is really only two years after Thriller, which I would have thought it was 10 years after, but you know, no. it's really... There was a, quite a period there of, mm -hmm. of, of really some exceptional albums. Yeah, um, you must but, have been busy. But I think this one might have been, this particular Prince album, might, that might have been done at uh, my studio on Sunset, when I first opened my studio. It's yeah, 84. 84. It could be, but I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly whether it was the last thing I did at A&M or, you know, because it was right in the transition. How long uh, have you been in this building? Uh, this is probably, let's see, it's got to be 25 years maybe. Quite a so, while now. So you were... But the all other. the way back to 84, when we started on Sunset, we, we had, we were part of the uh, building that has Ocean Way, which did a lot of very famous albums and recordings. But Barney, listen, man, it's um, hey. so yeah. Uh, great. Yeah. happy to know you, and, and we're going to do some great things hey. together. Yeah, we've got a nice lineup coming, so. We, well, we want to show them what, what uh, we're lucky enough to do, man. And uh, Well, you know, I'm pretty good at talking about this. I, I, I like talking <laughs> about it, you know, because, because it, it's been my whole life, you know. And, uh, you know, and, and I've always said that uh, the thing is, I'm not a young kid anymore, but I still feel like it a lot of times, you know, most of the time I do. Uh, because uh, it's just, just what I've, I've said to a lot of people, you know, you, you really have to find that in yourself, where your passion is. If you can really get a direct line to where your real true passion is, you never really run out of energy. <laughs> you're always there, and you're always excited, and you're always involved. So there's no way that I can do anything without getting concerned about how well it's done, and how well, and, and if everything's as good as it could be. It's just my nature is what I believe in. We want people to know who you were and what you've done. The history is important and it needs to be documented and that's why we're here and we really appreciate your time. Hey, this is the kind of stuff I want to work on too. I mean, it's a perfect combination. <laughs> hey.